Good, good morning. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, well, glad to see everybody up and about this morning. We're going to start with a word of prayer, if uh, you'll bow with me. Dear Lord, just thank you for this blessings of this life, Lord, and thank you for life itself. <clears throat> thank you for this great state of Georgia that we get to call home. I ask now that you would just lead, guide, and direct us today in everything that we do and say. I ask that you forgive us when we fail you, and I ask all this in your name. Amen. All right. At, at this time, the first order of business, I want to uh, do it. We've got three new members, and I think uh, they're all three here today, so that's, that's good. I'm going to let them, uh, if they would introduce themselves and where they're from and uh, and uh, what, what district and, and what, whatever they want to tell us. What, where are we at? All right. Representative Weedow. Good morning, uh, Representative Marcus Weedow from District 119, the Oconee County and Clark County representative. Appreciate being here. I'm happy to be on the committee, Mr. Chairman. Glad to have you. What, what number are you, Representative Matt? 29. Wait a minute, hold on, I'm 14. There you go, same thing. I'm Danny Mathis, I'm from District 144. Glad to be on this uh, committee. Uh, I serve a big portion of middle Georgia, Blakely County, Twiggs County, Wilkinson County, part of Lawrence, part of Jones, part of Bibb, part of Jones, part of Houston. So glad to be here, thank you very much. Glad to have you. What, what number? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Vance Smith. I represent District 133, which is parts of Muskogee, parts of Harris, and parts of Troop. Look forward to working with you. Glad to have you this morning. The, the first order of business, we need to uh, adopt the committee rules. Uh, everybody should have a, a copy in their handout. If you just take, take a minute to look over them. They're the same as uh, last year, uh, no changes. So, uh, Take a minute and look over those, and at the proper time, I'll entertain a motion. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. aye. All opposed, same sign. All right, we have adopted our rules. All right, at this time, I think we, we're going to have an update from uh, the driver services uh, commissioner, Commissioner Moore. Is he available this morning? Yes, sir. I am here. If you can see me and hear me, uh, we 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 can hear you. All right. Well, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, certainly uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, to give a, a, a brief update uh, to the committee uh, in regards to uh, the Department of Driver Services and and things that we've been doing here at the agency. I I wish, of course, I I have been had the opportunity to get to meet you down at Lake Park at the farmhouse restaurant. That'd been nice. Much nicer meeting, uh, and I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to do that this past year, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to do it this coming year. Um, I'm going to share my screen if it's uh, possible for you all, you all to see it. Um, and basically go through a slide deck that we put together uh, that I, I think helps give some uh, really good updates as far as the agency is concerned and things that we're focused on. Uh, as always, uh, we continue to be um, very focused on providing secure driver identities and credentials, uh, and we always want to do that with excellence and respect. Uh, that's our mission. Uh, that's something that we've really uh, tried to do over the last several years is change the culture uh, in which driver services have performed uh, its, its mission. Uh, and ensure not just that we provide timely service, but we do so uh, with excellence and respect. Um, if at any time uh, we, we fail to meet that mission, of course, it's, it's uh, my hope uh, that, it, that I'm made aware of it and, and we'll do everything that we can to correct it. Uh, but as an agency, that's what we're focused on and that's what we're continuing to do each and every day. Uh, there's a, this overview slide gives you a sort of a, a, a sneak peek into uh, what's happening in, in our world, uh, uh, especially uh, as it relates to the driver services portion. There's lots of things that we do with courts, uh, with records management, and uh, of course with law enforcement. Uh, but I wanted to highlight some of the things that I think we can all be proud of. Uh, we have 8.213 million Real ID enrolled customers in Georgia. That's 99% of our customers 
uh, or our citizens in Georgia are real ID compliant. That's important because at least the entire country. Uh, we um, started this path back in 2012, in July of that year. Uh, and since then, we have made a concerted effort to ensure uh, the people that are holding credentials in our state have brought in the proper identification uh, and, and uh, documents that ensures the integrity of that process. We're happy, again, to be 99% compliant, uh, again, leading the entire country. Uh, we do have 8.296 ballot drivers in our state. Uh, most people aren't aware of that. Um, unless you're, of course, caught in traffic, tra a rush hour, you might you might feel like all of them on, on 75, uh, 85 at the same time. But we do have a large population of valid drivers uh, in our state. One of the other things that I'm very proud of is the fact that we served 2.43 million people face to face uh, last calendar year. Uh, I repeat that number, 2.43, uh, 2.432 million people face to face and 1.7 million of them were served after the declared emergency for the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so our agency has done, in, in my view, a very good job of continuing to try to serve customers uh, in a very uh, precarious uh, environment. And I'll speak to some of that uh, here shortly. Uh, and of course, at the end, uh, offer or answer any questions uh, that any of the committee members uh, might have. Uh, we're also happy that 1.186 million uh, customers continue to use our online services and dds to go uh, This continues to be one of the most efficient ways to be served uh, if we can just get more adoption. So we're, we're hoping that customers learn that they can be served safely. Uh, and remember, uh, the online service is only for returning customers. So uh, everybody has to come in initially and prove themselves. Uh, but once you have done that and you have the real ID uh, star in the right hand corner of your license, then you unlock some opportunities that might uh, allow you to be served uh, not in a center. Uh, so uh, we're, we're certainly again happy about that. Um, 14,000 transactions is typically a peak day. So those are, that's gonna be 14,000 people uh, on average that come in uh, on Tuesday. That number goes down on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday slightly uh, to, to be somewhere between uh, 11, uh, 11 to 14,000 uh, on those particular days. About 5,000 uh, people come in uh, per day on Saturday. So uh, these are face-to-face -face customers who come into our building uh, so, uh, as you know, we have 67 locations around the state. We are working very hard to create that 68th one uh, over in Douglas County uh, through an uh, appropriation uh, last year of bond funding. Uh, so soon we will have another CDL site. Uh, and we're looking forward to that. A little bit about the agency as regards to turnover. Um, our agency, like uh, all other state agencies, um, turnover, quite frankly, actually uh, wasn't as high in this particular graph as it, it normally might be. This is uh, FY20, so this is July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2020. Uh, and if you look down at the bottom, you'll notice that our hourly driver examiners, these are mainly uh, part-time staff who work up to 29 hours a week. That's where we see our highest turnover number. Uh, we are quickly as an agency trying to uh, move away from that model. We implemented it back uh, at the uh, onset of the Real ID uh, in order to get more workers uh, in the workforce or in our centers so that we can handle volume. Uh, we, we feel like we now have a handle uh, on that volume. Uh, what, we're, what we're planning to do is move back to our model of having a driver examiner one uh, and, and driver examiner two, which are full-time positions uh, that, that going forward uh, as we draw down the number of hourly employees that we have. Uh, the hourly wage is $10.50 an hour. Um, obviously, you might imagine in, in Metro Atlanta, that's not going to com compete uh, with many um, workforces. So uh, it is a very high turnover uh, area. Uh, again, these numbers were fairly low, though, for this particular uh, fiscal year. Uh, I expect that number to be drastically higher, obviously, with the pandemic uh, that, that we've just seen for the, for the upcoming numbers. And I'll speak 
a little bit to what, what we're seeing here shortly. How we handled the COVID-19 uh, situation in our agency, uh, obviously we did the very best we could under very uh, tough situations, just like many of us uh, in, in, in our everyday uh, work. Uh, but we were fortunate to have a plan uh, that was developed back in uh, 2009 for what was then to expected to be the, the pandemic influenza uh, um, um, outbreak uh, for, for that particular year. Uh, so we had a plan uh, that was had to be dusted off and of course updated uh, to, the, to the next new technology and things that we do in the department today. But it was a real good starting point for how we could move forward and provide um, services to our uh, customers safely as well as protect our staff, uh, which is vitally important. So what you saw early on in the pandemic is we extended everyone's credential 120 days and those basically were people that were uh, expiring uh, during that period from March 14th to June 30th. So we pushed them out 120 days. Uh, so uh, we didn't immediately have that impact of people needing to come uh, right at the height of the pandemic, uh, that which would have caused obviously a, a, a lot of problems uh, in the potential for people to be driving uh, on suspended license. We closed our uh, customer service centers for 10 days. Um, so we didn't stay closed long. Um, only 10 days, we acquired the appropriate PPE. Uh, we we uh, started and, and concluded a couple months later uh, protective glass barriers between uh, our employees and the customers. Uh, obviously, uh, we, we've enhanced our cleaning services and, and basically um, done everything possible uh, to keep our staff safe while operating uh, in a very um, customer facing uh, high traffic um, environment. What we also did was implement it where possible teleworking. Uh, so we had we have out here at Conyers uh, anywhere, uh, depending on our ability to have all positions hired up to 300 team members who can work remotely uh, if we can we can uh, make that uh, work. And we were quickly able to disperse many of those team members uh, in order to keep the environment uh, as, as uh, socially distanced as possible uh, in, in order to obviously keep the operations and support of our team that's out in the field uh, moving forward. Um, <clears throat> so uh, one of the things that, that I really want to focus on is where we are today. We're still appointment mostly. And I say mostly because uh, we, we still have about 30% of people who book appointments that sh don't show up. And then we have 40% of people who actually show up that don't have appointments. If you come to our center uh, and it's not obviously 10, 30 minutes or an hour, uh, maybe even depending on how uh, busy it might be, we're gonna serve you. We're gonna do everything that we can serve you whether you have an appointment or not. Uh, so we've, we've made a concerted effort to not turn people away unless it's at the very end of the day. And, and certainly uh, from that standpoint, if we, we can't serve that person uh, and the people who have made our appointments, we then have to uh, ha ask those customers to come back the following day. We do require face masks for all of our team members. They do temperature scans. Uh, and then, of course, we do the six feet of social distancing when possible. Uh, we are constantly updating our team members on the latest uh, CDC recommend recommendations and those recommendations of the Department of Health uh, to do everything that we can uh, to, to keep them safe as well as our customers. Uh, something that I did want to share with you though, that I think is, is fairly important, uh, again, sort of a predictor of what, what we're going to see uh, over the next few, few uh, months uh, uh, during the, the pandemic, if we were, and this is customers facing staff, if we were, you know, uh, fully staffed, we'd have roughly 669 team members who are customer facing. Those are people uh, who are working in our centers or on our call center uh, operations. Uh, but it's, if you can look at the yellow line, um, those are the numbers that we actually have hired. Um, and the green number represents those that actually show up to work. 
Uh, and if you look at the bar graphs, uh, what you'll see is, you know, at the height of the pandemic back in April, we saw almost 18% of our staff not showing up to work. 14.4% uh, of that was related to COVID. Not that, that a person necessarily had COVID, but of course they had um, um, family uh, who lives with them that may have been affected and or uh, they simply couldn't make it because their kids were out of school uh, and, and of course uh, based on the pandemic. So we've been operating as efficient as possible, but with a much le lesser workforce than we normally would. Uh, we're seeing those numbers come back up. Um, I actually was in um, our, our new employee in orientation yesterday. Uh, it's amazing to see that we have some team members who, who left in the height of the pandemic uh, back in April and May of 2020, who are now coming back. Uh, so we hope to see some of those people come back. And of course, we're making new hires to get as high as possible uh, back to the number of people that we can serve our citizens uh, across the state efficiently. One of the things that I also wanted to kind of update the committee on, because many of these pieces of less legislation, of course, will, will come through the committee. Uh, there, are, there are basically uh, three pieces of le legislation uh, that are currently uh, being pursued, two, two actually, uh, uh, but, but one of them deals with our efforts to maintain compliance with the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. Uh, and and those, those bills will be, of course, uh, sponsored by you, Mr. Chairman, and, and many other members of the House. We certainly appreciate all the support, but we, we want to create efficiency where possible. So where you look at the first bullet, it says to change the expiration date of commercial license permits from 180 days to 365 days with no extensions. What we have today is the ability for a person to hold a commercial learner's permit for 180 days and then have the ability to get an extended for uh, one period, which basically gives them that 365 uh, that we're hoping to, to move up to or closer uh, to that number. So what we're trying to do is create efficiency for those commercial drivers, as well as our agency not require those, those persons to have to come back in to the center uh, and this is compliant, again, with the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration rules. Uh, the next is to require uh, our CDL communities to complete an entry-level driver training course. Uh, this is something that's being required by FMCSA. Uh, so we want to be compliant in every way uh, as it relates to this population. As most of you know, uh, while the Department of Driver Services licenses uh, commercial drivers, uh, most of those regulations are done uh, through federal statute and rulemaking. Uh, and it's, it, as a state, uh, like every other state, uh, when those rules change, uh, then our state has to become compliant. Uh, so by uh, next year, uh, 2022, uh, we will need to have that entry-level driver tra training completed. I will speak, uh, this is not an agency bill, but something I had a really good conversation with uh, representative, uh, representative Moptahan on yesterday uh, in regards to um, also enhancing the training of our commercial drivers uh, uh, with legislation uh, geared to meet uh, First Lady Marty Kemp's vision of, of, of training our commercial drivers on, on uh, human trafficking. So that is not an agency legislation, but it is something that of course uh, the agency certainly supports uh, and, and would like uh, to see uh, move forward. Uh, and we would appreciate very much the committee support. Uh, the, the next um, item for legislation that we're gonna be considering is permits uh, that for DDS to increase these fees. Uh, and the first one is a limited driving permit. And I wanna remind uh, the committee members what a limited, who holds a limited driving permit. Typically, it's people who have been uh, convicted of DUI, HV, hit and run, eluding an officer. Um, as a department, it takes, takes us just as much uh, effort uh, in order to issue a limit driving permit as it does a renewal or a new issuance. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't understand um, uh, as an agency 
uh, why that fee might, or we think that fee should be commensurate to the amount uh, that that people who are renewing uh, is paying. So uh, we're proposing to move that fee from $25 up to $32, which is the same amount uh, that that is the case uh, for, uh, again, a person that's renewing uh, or a new issuance. And then of course, the renewal fee will be increased from $5 to $10, which is something that we're hoping to do uh, also with all licenses. This is a, this, this quite frankly speaks to uh, some of our repeat customers um, uh, every single week. While most of us certainly we have the potential to lose uh, a license and that, that's natural, uh, but we see in some cases, um, uh, especially in, in younger drivers or, 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 or less um, safe drivers, persons who typically go to bars and, and things like that, those, those licenses are being uh, lost weekly, uh, uh, if not monthly. And we're replacing licenses over and over and over and over. Uh, and of course, from our standpoint, uh, we see this increase from $5 to $10, basically uh, be the cost of, of, of business for our agency. I think, Mr. Chair, we provided documentation that shows that it costs us roughly uh, very close to $10 to actually issue uh, these permits. So we're not asking uh, to, to go up on the fee in, a, in an enormous amount. We're simply trying to make the state whole. A um, couple other things I wanna highlight before we get to our drives project. is just the fact that our, our contact center or our call center is probably at its highest volume in history. Uh, we are, we answered, uh, excuse me, we received uh, last calendar year over 2 million calls. 73% uh, increase in the number of calls uh, that we got over the prior year. Uh, that's roughly 878,000 more calls uh, that we received in our contact center uh, last year. Obviously during the pandemic period is when those those numbers started to drastically go up. Um, there is a appropriation measure, measure uh, that is uh, uh, being asked uh, to support um, our ability to, to get technology uh, that will help us with, with this, this challenge, artificial technology, um, but human-like artificial intelligence uh, such that the customer will not know uh, if they're actually talking to one of our customer service agents or if they're actually talking to uh, this technology. So we're really looking forward uh, in working with the Georgia Technology Authority and rolling this, uh, this technology out. Uh, it's our belief that uh, if it proves to be successful for us, uh, then it certainly is something that can also be successful in other agencies. Uh, so we're hoping to use models, and I, I know many of us have this technology, whether it's Siri, Google, Alexa, uh, or whatever uh, you use for your particular uh, artificial intelligence, but we know uh, that it is, it is very uh, easy at this point uh, in our lives to ask questions of artificial intelligence uh, and have that, um, that technology respond back with the appropriate answers. This would not be for complex calls, uh, but this would be for those everyday mundane calls uh, that are currently uh, just too great of a number for our call center agents to answer. And lastly, I want to talk about our drives project, which is something that this committee and the entire General Assembly and the governor have supported wholeheartedly. Uh, we have been in partnership uh, with the Department of Revenue over a number of months. Uh, they were very successful last year in implementing uh, the project and being uh, the, the leaders in, in bringing this technology in Georgia. Uh, we have followed suit. Uh, and as of January 18th, uh, we also are now implementing uh, this system. Um, this is, this is uh, one of the greatest uh, achievements, I think, uh, of state government, especially in the driver and the vehicle area from the stand, standpoint of transitioning our state into a position where uh, we can become much more efficient. Uh, we were all working with technology that was decades old, uh, many decades, uh, up to four to five decades old uh, in the Department of Driver Services. So as you might imagine, it was very hard to get staff uh, 
especially younger staff coming in, operating um, what looks like a Commodore 60, 64 system, a green screen uh, where you can't actually point and click. You have to use a function key in order to move forward and backward into the system. Uh, that was very hard uh, to train uh, and get people to using that system. But once they became efficient at it, of course, uh, they were good at it. January 18th, uh, we are now operating the, the, the drives project in all of our centers. Also on that date, we became state to state compliant, becoming the 31st state to become state to state compliant. What that does for Georgia, it, it basically helps us eliminate a person perhaps moving to another state, trying to assume uh, a new identity or assume another record in another, another state uh, and, and trying to drive, especially if their infraction in Georgia still exists. So we become better uh, in ensuring people can't cross borders uh, and become licensed. Uh, and we know if you become licensed, there are other opportunities for you to do uh, things that you shouldn't be doing uh, if that happens. So we're very fortunate uh, to, to now have uh, that in place uh, where we can help prevent some of that from occurring. Uh, and it's, of course, a requirement of the Real ID uh, continuing status. Lastly, I just want to point out where we are. Uh, we have now served about 90,000 customers in the new system over the, the first two weeks. I told you on Tuesday, typically, we will see about 14,000 customers uh, in a particular day, and that's give and take. Sometimes it's a little bit less. Sometimes it's a little bit more. Uh, you'll notice that the first week, which was the week of uh, the 18th, uh, those Monday openings were soft launch openings, nothing more uh, than us trying to ensure the system was working properly uh, before people came in on Tuesday. But you also notice we were off. I mean, our centers were closed on the 14th, 15th, and 16th, uh, which resulted in more customers needing to come in the following week. So if you have been hearing about long lines at our centers over the last couple of weeks, this is why. Uh, we expect the efficiency that we've gained over the last several years uh, will continue to be uh, as efficient getting people in and out of our centers in 30 minutes or less. That is our goal. Uh, we are in an adoption phase. Uh, so uh, if you were to look at week over week, you'll notice by day uh, uh, through these two weeks, each week we've been able to serve more customers getting back to our normal volume uh, or ability uh, to get customer throughput. So we feel like we're in a very good position in a very short period of time. Uh, and again, this is transformational. Uh, we've had 470 plus people, uh, as I showed you in the prior graph, who have been doing something uh, one way uh, for as long as they have been here. Uh, now they're having to do it completely different. Uh, so we are happy with that adoption. With that, Mr. Chairman, I will uh, bring down um, the sharing and uh, be happy to answer any questions uh, that the committee may have. Well, thank you, Commissioner Moore. I just wanna take a moment just to thank you and your staff and all your employees for all the hard work and dedication that they've put in as we work through this pandemic to, to uh, keep Georgia the best state in the nation to do business, but also to live, work and play in as well. So, so thank you for that. Uh, uh, I do have one question, and my, my wife asked me uh, this weekend about the, the electronic driver's license. How, how's that pilot program? Uh, where, where do we stand on that? Pilot program is moving along uh, very well, and uh, certainly we thank you for the legislation. Uh, we we are in uh, conversation and talks uh, with a with a manufacturer of phones, uh, and and at this point uh, through NDAs, that's. Uh, about as, as, as much, and I'd love to come talk to any uh, one of you personally, but we're in conversations with a phone manufacturer now to conduct the pilot uh, here uh, in our state. Uh, and, and what we hope to see is uh, much like you see your ability to put your, your, your credit card uh, in your wallet, for example, uh, on your phone, uh, which is probably one of the most secure things that I think the bank, banking in, industry has used, as well as other uh, industries have used uh, in order to utilize, uh, not have to carry around a credit card. Uh, you can use that technology. We are working very hard uh, to 
with these phone manufacturers in order to create that technology uh, that is uh, with your phone. Again, this won't be a replacement of the regular credential. This will be an enhancement uh, to your, your credential uh, and it certainly will be at the customer's request. Uh, and our goal is to provide it to the customer free. Thank you, Commissioner. We've got one more question and then we're gonna move on for, for sake of time. Uh, Representative Kennard. Uh, thank you, Chairman Corbett. And thank you, Commissioner Moore, for your diligence, especially through this pandemic. I go on the DDS site quite frequently and find it very functional and effective and user-friendly. My question is, <clears throat> I have understood that it's the policy of DDS to provide a state ID for any of our returning citizens once they are, before they are released from our state prisons. Is that still the policy? And if so, is that happening effectively? It is, it is happening effectively. We work with the Department of, of Corrections uh, systematically and in, in person. So we have teams uh, who are working together. We've been doing this probably the last four or five years um, in order to get a credential into the hands of a uh, person who is um, coming out of the system. Again, the, the most important thing is many of these, these drivers or potential drivers they have reinstatement um, obligations that they have to meet that are beyond both the corrections and our abilities to meet. So when they don't come out with a credential, more, more than likely it's because they are unable to meet some of the obligations that they have as far as the reinstatement. They haven't completed their class or they haven't uh, paid, a, paid a particular fine. So those are the only cases where we would have a, a potential um, driver who's coming out of the prison system and not having their credential. But we are every single month uh, churning out uh, several numbers uh, in, in working with the Department of Corrections. More question? Sure. Uh, if they can't get a driver's license, can they still get a state ID? If they can meet the real ID qualifications, yes, sir, they can. Uh, if they can't get a driver's license, they can, and, and they're eligible for a real ID. Uh, many of uh, and when I say re eligible for a real ID, a as you know, uh, like you and, and I, when we go, we have to present our, uh, present our birth certificate. We have to present our, uh, our Social Security Administration uh, information. And then, of course, we have to present uh, some information as to where we live. Uh, and that's one of the most important things that I think uh, sometimes we forget about. Uh, many of these uh, persons may uh, not go back to where they, they once lived. Uh, so um, in every instance, we, we don't want to create uh, an address for uh, these people. Uh, we, we need to make sure that they have established an address uh, so, so that we know that where they are. So those will be the only cases in which we aren't able to provide those documents. Well, thank you again, Commissioner Moore. At this time, we, uh, we'll move on. We've got uh, Commissioner David Curry with Department of Revenue, if he is available. Yes, sir, Mr. Commi Mr. Chairman, are you with me? Can yes. you hear me? Yes, <laughs> go, go ahead with your presentation. We're... All right, very well. Today I brought with me Motor Vehicle Director Brent Bennett. Uh, there's not a single individual in the state of Georgia that knows more about motor vehicles than this man. So he's put a PowerPoint together. Uh, Director Bennett, if you'll go ahead and share your screen and get started, I think they're on a time crunch here. Great, thank you. Can you guys see my screen? You should be able to yeah, see my screen. Yes, we, we can see it. All right, great. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairman Corbett and members of this committee. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Curry. So good morning, guys. Um, what I have today is our agenda. Um, we have a brief recap of, um, of uh, we're going to have a brief recap of, 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 our, of our purpose here at Motor Vehicles uh, and our objectives. And let's get to the next screen here one second. Here we go. And we'll go over our drives and, and our MVD strategic goals. We'll go over some objectives that we've achieved over the last year and our current goals and future plans. And we'll go over what, what we deem to be our pandemic uh, response. I know we're on a time crunch, so I'll try to go through as fast as I can. Um, we'll, we'll go to uh, talk. So, so, so for the new members, I know we have three new members of this committee. So the DOR and the tax commissioners, basically we have a partnership. Uh, the tax commissioners are agents for the Department of Revenue. 
Uh, so they collect and disperse TAVT and Valvalorum revenue. Uh, they perform most of the title transactions um, uh, for the state and uh, they register and issue tags and renew registrations. From a DRR perspective, we, we, we run the Motor Vehicle Program Administration and we support the county tag offices. Uh, we basically do tier two support. Uh, we do do titles, but we don't really collect any TAVT. We do do corrections, replace title, title replacement, salvage, court orders, et cetera. We do have a business registration department that handle uh, dealers and we do commercial registrations, which includes uh, IRP transactions. So that's what we do here. So that's just a simple overview of what we do here for our new members on the on the Motor Vehicle Committee. So uh, Commissioner Moore spoke a little bit about DRIVES, which is a driver record and integrated vehicle enterprise system. This is a multi-year effort uh, between the Department of Revenue and the Department of Driver Services. And this basically overhauled and modernized the two of Georgia's largest and most complex le legacy application systems. And this impacts every driver and, and vehicle owner in the state of, of Georgia. And, and as he indicated, uh, th there is two phases of this implementation. Uh, the first phase was Department of Revenue. We went live uh, during uh, Memorial Weekend, May 2019. So we've been on this system uh, for basically 19 months. And uh, as Commissioner Moore just stated, uh, uh, January 18th, uh, DDS went live, but not only that DDS went live, we actually also DR did a, an upgrade, a system upgrade, because we went from V11 or version 11 to version 12. So there was some work that we had to do as well. Uh, the great thing about drives is like, like Commissioner Moore said, we, we went to a whole different stratosphere. And uh, there, there is a national motor vehicle uh, association called an American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators. And I'm proud to say that DRIVES has won some prestigious awards. And, in, in, and so we won an award at AMBA for the Region 2 Excellence in Government Partnership Award. And this award recognizes a successful project and program developed and implemented. It's sort of a public private sector uh, joint organization. We won that award and I'm very proud to say that it was a, a lot of hard work uh, between us and DDS and, and FAST as well, our vendor. And we also won top awards, uh, top honors, I should say, in the 2020 GTA Innovation Showcase. So what did we achieve? Uh, we, we, were, we were happy. We implemented HB 779, which was a bill that was passed last year to reallocation of TAVT. Uh, local TAVT was an adjustment that was made that was passed last year. It was implemented in August in time for July uh, distribution. Uh, OCGA 40-3-26 basically requires lien holders to file and release title liens electronically. Drives really, really helped us with this. Um, basically, it, it, it allowed us, because of, 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 of drives, we're now able to file a lot of liens electronically. And then we saw in Q2, 96% of titles are now done elect file electronically. That is a tremendous thing. Uh, that's one of the things we set forth. I know the governor asked us to, to do some cuts and that's one of the things we did. We, we, we pushed hard to make sure we got our titles filed electronically. That's gonna have some, some economic savings for us down the road. And uh, one of the bills that passed a few years ago was HB 898 uh, for electronic fleet renewals. We now have, have 155 counties that are now online doing fleet renewals. That, that is significant as well. So what did we do in drives phase two? Well, it was big. Um, it, was, it was really big because it, it, I know you're looking at it well. Yes, we know DDS went live. That's a massive thing. But for us, it was also big because we had to go from version 11 to version 12. We had to do 2,700 threat scenarios. We had 127 testers doing all these different scenarios. We had to redo all these test scenarios. We had to reach out to all these different various uh, stakeholders. And that included you, uh, stakeholders, uh, such as lawmakers. We had to reach out to all of our various stakeholders. Tax commissioners had to be involved. Our vendors, our public officials, business partners, insurance companies, lenders, ins um, GIADA, GADA, all these different vendors were very important. We had to reach that out. We actually, this implementation went on over the MLK weekend. And I must say, this was a very, very, very successful launch. We, we are very happy. It went very well, very smooth. I'm very, very happy, very, very proud of my team, very proud of DDS and everybody. It was very well done. Another objective we achieved um, was scanning. Well, 
for those of you who don't know, one of the strategic goals for us at, at DOR was people don't know that every time a title is done in a county tag office, the county tag office have to actually send those titles physically to our office here at South Meadow in Atlanta to be scanned. And we set about a, a very strong goal of, hey, we wanted to eliminate that paper shifting and moving from county because things can get lost. We set about this goal. The problem was the pandemic hit. And we had set out a goal where people were actually going to go. We were going to teach them to scan. And we actually did all of this stuff remotely. And if you look at this graph, the, the graph was at uh, the pilot began in February. And then the pandemic hit in, a, in, in March. And so you look at the graph and you're like, OK, what happened in May? Well, in May, you notice for two weeks in May, we had our entire unit shut down where they could do no work. And so that's why you see nothing got done because what happened is we had to shut down our office for two weeks, that particular office that scanned because we had somebody who was impacted. So we were able to have one of our employees, a couple of employees actually work remotely with the counties to get all of this scanning done remotely. And the, the positive is that now nothing has to be done. They don't have to send any information to us. Everything is scanned at the county tag offices Okay, no need for the motor vehicle to scan any of the information. The information is scanned at the county tag offices. The images are great. Nothing's, the counties are saving money. They don't have to ship anything, reduce costs. The Im images are great. The Im images are immediate. Everything is done. As you can see, look at the images chart. We are not getting, so it's money being saved across the board. So we see this as a very positive for both the county tag offices and us. So that's a very positive thing for us. So one of the more aggressive goals that we're going to set for ourselves is a Go Green initiative. As you can see by the flyer that I have here is our, one of the things we want to do is to try to get our counties or get citizens to try to get their renewal notices by email. Currently, 99.9% .9 of everyone is getting their renewal notices by mail. So we set about this aggressive goal to get 10% of renewal notices to be emailed by fiscal year, by the end of fiscal year 2024. We believe potentially counties could save about $500,000 annually. Now, of course, we know everybody don't, doesn't have internet access, but a lot of people do, and we're pushing this hard. We're gonna send this out to the counties. They could post this. We're gonna have some tax commissioners aligned with us, and we believe this is a very aggressive goal, but one that can be done, and we're gonna need everybody's help on this, and the counties are on board with us. As you guys remember, um, for you guys today, last year there was a bill introduced and passed, I believe, in the House regarding digital license plates. We are aware that a similar bill may be introduced this year. As such, we decided to work with a, a digital license plate vendor to do a digital license plate pilot. We're looking at doing a pilot for about six to eight months. We're looking at 16 vehicles with Department of Revenue vehicles, Department of the Georgia Forestry Commission vehicles, the pilot's probably going to just include law enforcement and so the reviews. And we're basically just looking at doing the plate durability, visibility, functionality, make sure it works before this bill is passed. So it's just something that we're testing to make sure this is work. We've also spoken to the state of Pennsylvania. They've done, they've also done a digital license plate pilot. And we've, we've so spoken also to the state of Texas as well. So we're doing our homework just in case anything comes about of this. So we're looking ahead, more proactive. Another thing that we're looking at as well, and this is also in the future, but it's really the future is now, is e-signatures. Why e-signatures and why now? Well, NHTSA, which is the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, changed their ruling about a year and a half in November of 2019. They no longer require a wet signature on a title application when declaring mileage. Well, what does that mean? That means that dealers can basically sell a car without actually somebody coming in and signing a title application in person. So we, we were approached by some manufacturers as well as dealers, and we started putting things into place. This actually helped because of the pandemic. So we actually wanted to create options to some of these dealers. We actually put this into place with our solid vehicle process 
we believe Georgia is already a leader in this in this area. And we opened this up to our ETR vendors and we're starting to see some dealer sales with e-signatures. We created new forms. Uh, we have a new electronic dealer reassignment. We eliminated the need for a notary on a various forms. So we're seeing some really good things. Now, we have, there's no need to panic. We have this, this thing called the NIST level certification. NIST stands for National Institute of Standards and Technology Level 2 certification, which is basically dual authentication. And again, there's, there's the need for elimination of, of, of the notary. And all these things are covered in NHTSA. So we feel very, very comfortable. And this is where the future lies because dealers want it. It gives them great flexibility. We know not all dealers will use it, but it gives them flexibility. And that's where the marketplace is headed. And I know Commissioner Moore will speak briefly about their pandemic response. And, and I know we wanna speak about that as well. And what do we do? Governor extended uh, expiration dates. Drives allowed us to, to do some things to assist in that in that area as well that our old system would not have allowed us to do. Definitely what the system did, it did, it allowed our employees the opportunity to work from home. I can assure you that Drives gave us that flexibility. Currently, we have about 45% of our staff, all of our call center staff can work remotely. Um, we have tremendous virtual training opportunities. We've done uh, multiple webinars. Um, we are allowed to do our call center stuff from home, like I indicated, we are training our counties virtually now. We can do webinars, we can do customer service training. We have our South Meadow location uh, is appointment only. We, we have a lot more options now. And I'm gonna show you some, some response in terms of uh, how we handle from a customer service kiosk. If you look at our chart here, uh, in the blue line is 2019. And if you look at our red line, or, or, or orange, it's the kiosk for 2020. Look at the vast difference in people's usage in 2020 versus 2019. It's tremendous. And if you look at the months of April through June, where the counties were basically closed, it was tremendous. And so people are using the technology and we want people to use the technology. And so my next slide here is going to show you what our kiosk program is about. It began in 2014, 18 counties have one kiosk or more locations, 30 additional counties allow customers to use a kiosk. And our customers in participating counties may use a kiosk anywhere in Georgia. So if your county decides to participate, you can use a kiosk anywhere. So if, you're, if your county, let's say Chatham County is a participating county and you are in Atlanta for that weekend and there's a, there's a county, there's a, there's a kiosk in Kroger, you can renew. Luckily, and I'm so proud to say, I, I believe it's November of last year, we had a 1 million transaction. That's big. Um, all we require is an agreement with the payment processor. And as you can see, so many counties in red have not yet signed up or signed on to be a, at least a participating county. We keep, we keep getting more counties coming on. We're convincing them and hopefully more will sign on. So we're hoping, we're hoping they'll come on. And look, look at our web renewals. Again, the blue line trending and look at the red line. Again, 2020 numbers are higher. We had, we had about 18 more counties come on uh, in 2020 than in 20, from 2019. And again, that's because of the pandemic. But again, I, honestly, folks, this program began in 2000, and I'm still not quite sure why we still don't have every county on this. But again, it's not mandatory by law, so it's still the option for the tax commission to make that decision, but it's not something that we control, but we continue to try to convince them. So with that, I'll leave it up to you guys if you have any questions for us and Commissioner Curry. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Bennett. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Curry. Uh, I don't see any questions at this time. So we appreciate, uh, again, what, what you and your uh, department has done through this pandemic. So uh, thank you again. We, we, we're going for sake of time. We're going to move on. We've got some uh, presenters on some bills uh, we need to get through. They've come a long way to testify, and we want to make wise use of our time. So at this time, I'm going to ask uh, Chairman Cantrell to come up and present HB 43. 
Thank you, Chairman Corbett. Appreciate the opportunity. I'll be very brief. HB 43 is a bill that was heard before this committee last year, sponsored by Chairman McCall. I co-sponsored the bill last year. Um, it came in late in session, got caught up in rules during the when COVID hit, uh, so it never got got voted on, but uh, you guys support it in the past. The only change to the bill is, uh, I'll let Chairman Nick speak to that in a moment. I don't have the sub in front of me, but he, there's one small change and he'll talk about that. But basically all this bill does, it's very simple, is it allows a driver when they're registering their uh, license plate to designate an alternative emergency contact number and also indicate if they have a physical, mental, or neurological condition which impedes their ability to communicate trying to avoid any miscommunications between uh, law enforcement and an individual who might have some challenges in communicating. Don't want that misunderstanding. So this, this law would give the, <clears throat> the officer a heads up that the person that, they're, that they might encounter behind the wheel of the vehicle that they just pulled over has some challenges communicating. I uh, spoke with my sheriff about this bill. He's in full support. Uh, uh, feels there's no issues with it, very little training involved. All it adds is a, is a field on the registration form when you register for your uh, license plates, completely optional. Uh, the person does not have to participate in this, but if they would like to, for law enforcement to have an alternative contact number and, and to know ahead of time that they have some communication challenges, it allows them to do so. Thank you, Representative Cantrell. And we are working off of LC 392803S. That is the sub. We, we've got in, in front of us. So that's that's what we, we are working off of if everybody has that in front of them. Like uh, Representative Cantrell said, this is the same bill uh, except for one change and, and uh, Chairman Nix will uh, address that uh, when he comes up. Well, we can hold questions till after uh, Chairman Nix uh, comes forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to give the committee just an idea how I got involved with this, you've got a young lady you'll hear from in just a few minutes, Serenity Graham, who had contacted me back in uh, October about this concept. Uh, as you'll see when she speaks, she's quite passionate about it. Uh, she has a son uh, who could possibly be affected with it, and she had asked if it might possibly be called Walker's Law, uh, as that is his name. That would be the only change if you look at uh, the LC number he referred to, 392803S, uh, line 10 was added to this act shall be known and may be cited as Walker's law. Um, I didn't know a lot about it when she called me. Uh, I called the chairman and found out that the bill had passed last year and had gotten caught up. But as I've looked around and talked around, I think it's very timely to do this for a lot of reasons. Um, with the people who have these issues, uh, it gives them an opportunity to not be misunderstood. I think it's a big advantage for our law enforcement too. So many of the issues we have where we end up with deadly situations with law enforcement starts with a traffic stop. And if they can know that the person may have an issue with communication or something, I think it makes it good for them. And the ones that I've talked to have been very supportive of it as well. So uh, that's the reason I got involved. Uh, uh, Chairman Cantrell had already dropped the bill, was more familiar with it. So I just asked him to, uh, add that part and he agreed to do it. I've passed out a few things that uh, Ms. Graham gave me. Uh, as you'll see, she's the type of person you want, want helping with your uh, legislation because she's pretty much drawn it out for you there. But uh, unless there are any questions, um, we can let her speak or if you'd like me or, or Chairman Cantrell. To Chairman Nixon, this time, why don't we let Ms. Graham come forward and, and uh, address okay. the committee. Okay, thank you. This is, uh, this is Serenity Graham. Yes, she is. I've known her for quite a while. She actually lived in the neighborhood I did growing up. Uh, her father's a retired Marine. That's the big thing I can tell you about her. But yeah. uh, she's also a, a teacher uh, in Troop County. And she'll tell you a little bit more about herself uh -huh. and about uh, uh, her son. So if you'll come on. If she'll state her name and, and tell us uh, what she wants to tell us. Good morning. My name is Serenity Graham. Um, I'm a teacher in Troop County. I've taught for 20 years. And... Uh, Two years ago, we had a like wide wake up call in our house and Walker, my son who's sitting over here to the left, was diagnosed with type one diabetes. If you look at Walker, he looks completely fine. He looks normal, you know, goes to school, goes to work, uh, goes to church, has friends and, and lives in our safe little bubble. However, in about six weeks, he's gonna be released to the world as a driver. 
And when he is released to that world, there are so many people that have no idea that there are um, diseases and illnesses that can alter a person's behavior, such as diabetes. And I have heard so many stories about misunderstandings and, and just things that have happened that if a law enforcement officer had prior knowledge, wouldn't have happened. I would like to suggest um, to you guys for just protection through knowledge for all of these people who have another battle that we don't even know that, deal, that they deal with. As a teacher, we don't go into our classrooms blindly. I don't go in and just assume that everybody can hear, everybody can articulate correctly, and that there's no other underlying issues. We have what we call infinite campus, and our infinite campus is our knowledge base for us. So before I even meet my students, before they walk through the door, I have symbols next to their names. If there's a health issue, I have that symbol that's right in front of you. And that symbol tells me, watch out. This person might have an asthma attack. They might be allergic to nuts. They, um, they might have an EpiPen. They might have type one diabetes. And as a teacher, what a heads up it is for that. They might have a visual or auditory processing disorder. And that's my job to now understand that student and to base my reactions based off of theirs. Um, I would like to propose a permanent symbol on a, the option to have a permanent symbol on a driver's license for people who do have these underlying issues that are, don't look like they would. I mean, Walker looks perfectly fine over there <laughs> and he would look perfectly fine walking down the street and so would many other people who have been diagnosed with things like schizophrenia and bipolarism and um, just have epilepsy and mobility in parents and autism. You would never know just walking down the street I would love to have a permanent symbol that is um, on that driver's license, but also hooked to a tag that says, no matter what in Georgia, if that symbol is somewhere, it's, a, it's an issue. You need to call 911, whether that means, you know, he's at a movie theater and passes out, or, you know, one day goes off on his own to college and everybody has an ID, everybody has a license just about, and there needs to be some way to provide protection for those people, even in a car accident. You know, who do you go to first? You need to know who you're going to go to first. People with pacemakers. There's so many different issues that fall under the ADA that could be protected and could give us a base knowledge of what we're dealing with before we even arrive at a situation. I have a, a colleague of mine, um, a very dear friend who's who has a family member that, that suffers with schizophrenia. And, and, and I'm just gonna say it like it is, he is an African-American male and he's about to drive. And there's days, you know, where you have great days, just like we do, our blood sugar is great. We have awesome days, but then there's days where you don't. And what if it's that one day that somebody gets pulled over and they're just having an off day. And that's the day that something has escalated when it could have been avoided if that officer or EMT or firefighter, whoever's there, had prior knowledge to that person before they even get out of the vehicle or when they ask for their license, a symbol on a license, a permanent symbol, not a sticker that can come off in a wash, a permanent symbol is what I'm asking for on a license if the person wants to provide it. Um, I'm a member of so many type one support groups across Georgia and across the United States as well. And I have many parents that um, when I posted that I was actually getting to come to a hearing committee for Walker's Law, um, immediately it blew up. I had California, we're rooting for you. Texas needs this, bring it to New York. <laughs> as a parent, if I can't fix my kid, I wanna protect him. And there's not, it's not just me, there's so many other people that fall in the same category. So I'm asking the state of Georgia to consider this. We need identification for people who fall under these areas in the ADA. Um, I never knew it, but even with entering Six Flags <laughs> with Walker, I mean, the day we went to Six Flags after he was diagnosed, you know, a year later, we didn't know, we had to have all these forums. <laughs> 
We had to get like a medical form from the doctor and then on a letterhead, a letter saying that he was allowed to, you know, have certain supplies in the park and that he really was a type one diabetic. And I know I'm not the only parent that feels that. So I, I just feel like if there was a way to provide an identification mm -hmm. for those who start with a permit at the age of 15, that when he goes off by himself or he goes to Six Flags by himself, he's got it. It's right here. It's on his license. It's tied to his tag. And that I don't have to ever worry about a situation that could be misunderstood. But not only me, like I think about students that I've had in my classroom and they do, they have auditory processing disorders where they struggle and it can be taken so quickly for disrespect, but it's not, it's not. And I would like to, um, to build community awareness through that and give everybody the option, opportunity, their choice to disclose that when they file for a driver's permit along with a driver's license, a permanent symbol for Walker's Law. And I would like to call it Walker's Law because of Walker. Well, th thank you, Ms. Graham. We've got a couple questions and I'm not sure if they're for Wes or, or Chairman uh, Nix or, or yourself, if everybody come to the podium and we'll, we got number 16, uh, Representative Montahan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is that me? Okay. Good deal. Uh, I had a quick question. Um, I'm just reviewing the bill. Uh, and this would be for Representative Cantrell. Chairman Cantrell, I'm sorry. Uh, Chairman, does this bill do uh, what we were just talking about? No, it doesn't. And um, I would suggest that the committee uh, look at the HB 43 as a first step. We've had some conversations. I'm in complete agreement with what Mrs. Graham is talking about. I think it needs to be looked at. I think driver's license is probably the primary way to do it. There are there are other ways too. It could be a could be a um, a more comprehensive approach, but that's a much more complicated issue than the one we're dealing with today. What we're dealing with today is a, is a baby step. It's a big step, but it's a baby step towards what ultimately we need to do to provide those with these kind of issues a way to make people aware that's appropriate. It doesn't uh, it doesn't stigmatize them, but but it's an appropriate way for those who want others to know that I've got this issue that might be showing itself today. Uh, it's it's very appropriate. We need to look at it, and and um, but that's not in this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, one, one further question. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as I read through the bill, um, I, I just want to see if you can walk me through the operability. I think what I'm seeing is that if a law enforcement officer were to pull over uh, somebody who has one of these listed medical conditions, uh, that that would be in the GCIC, and they would they would know that from pulling it up on the computer. Just walk me through the kind of the operability. It would be on the when they scan the license plate and ran the information there. That information okay. would be for them, and it would, so we would need a little bit of training on behalf of officers to know to look for that. It would be new. Okay. So yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Number two, Representative Kennard. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chairman Cantrell and uh, Chairman Nix, and thank you, Ms. Graham. Uh, would the specific diagnosis be identified or is it just a general medical issue or would the specific diagnosis be made aware of? I think it's a, it's a, a general, but we don't have room for a lot of information. So it's just a general diagnosis to give the officer a heads up that this person might have some communication challenges. And it also gives an alternative number. So the officer could call that number to talk to someone who would be, who would know the specifics of that person's uh, you know, condition that could fill the officer in at that point. Okay, one more question, sir. Um, yes. So, cause it's, you would handle schizophrenia differently than you would ha sure. handle asthma. So that I was wondering if that specificity would be important. It would be, and that, that's, the, that's the idea behind the alternative uh, phone number is to, is to give that specificity. But that's a great question, uh, Representative Kennard. And uh, we're trying to kind of get started on this thing. And then we may have to come back and make some adjustments as we see how it actually ends up working out. Right. It's modeled after uh, legislation from Texas. It's been very effective there. And, uh, and so we, tried, we basically just copied what they did over there because it's been uh, well received and done very well over there. Thank you. Number seven, Representative Alexander. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
I'm trying to understand too, from the perspective, uh, cause I've done a lot of work in when it comes to mental health. And so I know that stigmatization is there. And so a lot of applicants are not gonna wanna put that right, on that right. information. So even if it's included, some individuals are not going Correct. to want to identify with that. So I'm trying to understand from the perspective of when that individual is filling out their registrations, that's when they will identify that they have this issue. That's correct. And it's at their option. Right. They, it's not mandated. And then, and then I agree also with the other representative. There are so many. Correct. And how would the officer understand what that is because it is a lot yeah and it's training and it's the alternative phone number yeah okay thank you for this that's all the question uh, questions that i have uh miss leslie with dds did send me a text uh so she's watching online thank you for watching but she said they have an option where they can actually put stuff on the back of their license now uh, ask her, would it be an easy fix? And she said, uh, yes, and just complete a form mm. that maybe they, that's why they didn't include this in the bill. So that option is there now for somebody who wants to put that on the back of the license. Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, I guess, I guess my concern would be um, that like if I, if Walker is driving his truck, that, that tag is going to be registered to his father and I. So to me, having a 16 year old kid, and I know I'm not the only one, there has to be a way to identify these drivers. And I know you can like put something on the back of a license. I know that in some states there's just, they give you like a little gold sticker to put on your license, but I can tell you right now how many times a permit has gone through the wash already and a sticker is just gonna come off. And so what a lot of us are pushing for and is just there, the option to have a, a medical symbol on a, on a license that says, hey, heads up, like no matter where you are, no matter where he is, no matter where he is in a Six Flags park at Disney at the beach, you know, if he were to fall out or have a medical emergency, it's a universal symbol to call 911. So I would like to push for that as well, but also a way to tie the medical diagnosis. When he checks his license, I want him to put type one diabetic, but the license plate tag itself will be registered to his father and I. So that wouldn't help necessarily Walker in a situation, but he'll have his license and that would help him. Representative Contreo, thank you. Actually, actually it would help Walker because when you register your truck, if he's a potential driver, you would have the option of putting that information in there to, to make the law enforcement aware if it's, you know, that if it's him, this is what he may, you know, because the officer doesn't know yet who's driving the car, but he'll know that one of the potential drivers might have a condition that he needs to be aware of. So yes, it would address that. All right. Any further questions? And, and, and I, I agree with, with, with uh, Representative Cantrell. This is a, a first step. And if we need to go, go farther, we, we will definitely uh, continue to pursue that. But, but in, in, in this bill, what would be the pleasure of the committee? I got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed? All right, you got your bill. We, we've got one other measure. If, if, if people can, can stay for just, just a, a couple minutes. So Representative Weedauer, and you can present it from, from right there. It's just an update, a date change on, on, a, on a bill, House Bill 174, is that correct? If you present that, if everybody can stick around for just a minute. 15, all right. This is House Bill uh, 174 LC 392806, simply a yearly uh, codification of the date for Department of Public Safety. Um, certain members of this committee, uh, committee suggested that this was beneath caring for a, a third term or third year person, but uh, I'm here to give uh, our law enforcement everything they need. Any questions? I don't see any questions. So all we're doing is changing the date to from 20 to 21. 20 to 21. Uh, any questions? What would be the pleasure of the committee? Got a motion to pass and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Bill carries. Meetings adjourned. Thank you all for hanging around.